All righty. We be recording, and I shall share my screen. We'll take a peek see here. Okay, I can shrink that puppy. Pull this up here. Today's topic, psycho, not that one, loudness and pitch. I don't want that one. What the heck am I doing? I don't want loudness and pitch. That's, right. We did that last week. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Let me go to OTC documents. Oh, you get to see how I organize my computer here. OTC, HIS 110, and I want masking. There you go. That's the, there be the topic. Come on. Oh, yeah. There you go. Psychoacoustics, masking, critical bands, binaural masking level differences. It appears more complicated than it really is. People can make this stuff really sick. I don't want to do that. But it has a lot to do with hearing aids. It has almost everything to do because people bellyache about, ma about background noise in hearing aids all the time. And here we'll kind of take a look at how come. The background noise masks what you want to hear. So masking doesn't mean, well, I'll show you a mask I got here. In our field, we often use, the, we often uh, talk about masking, and uh, it's a, I could show you a mask I got from South Africa, okay? People oh, always cool. talk about masks. I had to do that. This is recorded, and yeah, people can see how seriously we take the subject today. I got this in Johannesburg, South Africa, when I was t working for Unitron Hearing Aids. Had me do a talk there. Anyway, masking is a term you're going to run into all the time in this field. Masking is done in hearing tests, okay, and that's the, that's the type of masking used to keep the good ear busy when you're testing the bad ear. Now, Kelly or Megan, are you taking um, uh, audiometry? Okay, so this is relevant to what you're studying. Okay? Yeah, we, just, we just did that masking, yeah. Yeah, so masking is in audiometry. We're talking about keeping the good ear busy while you're testing the bad ear so that the sound doesn't cross your head and get to the good ear, okay? So if you've got a really bad left ear and you put more than 40 decibels in, it's going to cross over and your good ear is going to hear it and you're going to raise your hand. But you're not testing the ear you say you're testing. The masking we're talking about today has nothing to do with that, okay? That's audiometric masking. Okay. What we're talking about is how certain sounds cover other sounds. And the take-home lesson from this topic today is low frequencies mask high frequencies better than high frequencies mask lows. Okay, they call that the upward spread of masking. Lows mask highs better than highs mask lows. The rumble of a truck blah, 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 will cover the peeping of a canary peep, 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 better than the peeping of a canary can cover or mask the rumbling of a truck. Okay, and we'll talk about how come that is the case. And the reason why that's the case is anatomy, it's the cochlea, it's hair cells. It's the way your cochlea works. And that's what we're getting to today, the upward spread of masking. So we'll also look at the uh, PowerPoint that we have. It's all about these guys called hair cells. So when you're looking at this, normal hair cells, and you're looking at this, damaged hair cells, Where's the damage mostly, to the inners or to the outers? And the answer would be to the outers. The word sensory neural is a good word to use. Sensory neural, okay? I'm just going to highlight this guy here so we can see the screen here. Sensory is outer hair cells. Neural is inner hair cells. Think of it that way. Inner hair cells send all information to the brain. Without them, you're deaf, okay? But the inner hair cells have a fundamental flaw. They cannot pick up sounds below 50 or 60 dB. 
They need the physical help of the outer hair cells to do that. And so I'll show you in a picture what that might look like. Look at this movement of the outer hair cells. The way the outer hair cells are shrinking, whoops, the way they shrink and they pull that tectorial membrane, this blue membrane, they're pulling it down so that the inner hairs can get bent. Do you see that? If the sounds are greater than 60 or greater than 50, there's enough fluid motion inside the cochlea to move the hairs of the inner hair cells. But if the sounds trying to activate the cochlea are softer than 50 dB, you need the physical help of the outer hair cells to help the inner hair cells send information to the brain. That's why the outers die first. They are the moving part. Now, we've covered this before, okay, but it's just very important to keep that in your minds. Now, here is a traveling wave without outer hair cell action. And you'll notice in this traveling wave a bump right here. And that's, now think of this, follow my cursor here. Inner hair cells would be all along this membrane, right at the edge, okay? This membrane is the floor upon which the outer hair, upon which the hair cells stand. It's this, see that? It's that basilar membrane, okay? It's the floor. So pretend that, whoa, I'm jumping ahead here. Pretend, whoops, see if, there we go. Pretend that a low frequency, this guy's hearing a low frequency sound. So at the base of the cochlea, that's not where the traveling wave is. The traveling wave is occurring near the apex of the cochlea. And you will recall that it works exactly bass backwards to the way you think, okay? The widest hair cell region is at the narrow tip of the cochlea. The narrow hair cell region is at the fat, wide end of the cochlea. Okay, always remember that. Now, this has more mass. That's why it's activated by low frequencies. It has more mass, less stiff. Here, you've got less mass, more stiff. So high frequencies stimulate the base. So again, looking at the picture here, you'd have five rows of outer hair cells where my cursor is. You'll have four rows of outer hair cells where my cursor is, and you'll have three rows of outer hair cells at the base of the cochlea. So this guy is hearing a low frequency sound, but guess what? He's missing outer hair cells. So look at all the frequencies he's hearing at once. Say a 250 hertz tone came to his ear. He's getting a low frequency traveling wave. Information is being sent to his brain. But guess what? There's all kinds of, he can't distinguish between frequencies close together, okay? Because he's lost his outer hair cells. If you've got functioning outer hair cells, you've got this sharpening. So you've got two things that have happened with outer hair cells. First of all, the traveling wave got bigger, taller, bigger amplitude. Second of all, it got sharpened. Okay, now this is all stuff we've covered last week and the week before in psychoacoustics. All this is history. Now today we are focusing on the shape of the wave. Look at the envelope. What I mean by the envelope is if you trace the wave, look at the orange. If you trace the outline of the wave, it looks like a kite lying sideways, doesn't it? And the front is steeper and the back slopes. That's the asymmetrical shape of the traveling wave envelope. And it explains the upward spread of masking. Now we said last week with damaged hair cells, you've got smaller traveling waves. This guy's hearing two frequencies. The top is normal. He's hearing two frequencies close together. He can distinguish. Outer hair cell damage, two things have happened. The sharpening is gone and the amplitude is gone. Take hearing aids, put them on the guy, you've got the third one. You've made the middle waves bigger, but you haven't been able to sharpen. And we said last week that's the twofold role of hearing aids. They need to amplify, but amplifying is only half the goal. They have to 
also increase the signal to noise ratio, the signal being speech and background noise being the noise. So that's the role of directional microphones in hearing aids to pick up sound in the direction you're facing. And also that's the role of digital noise reduction. That's the role of remote microphones worn on the lapel of the loved one at a restaurant so that he or she, that's like bringing the hearing aid right up to the lips of the speaker so that the teacher can talk into the, the mic is picking up the teacher or the loved one's voice and being sent by Bluetooth or FM straight to the person's hearing aids. Okay, that way you're increasing signal to noise because Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall and all the king's horses couldn't put Humpty together again. The cochlea, once broken, is broken. So the sharpening of the peaks is gone for good. You can't get that back. With sensory neural hearing loss, we said, your, your floor is raised. And that's really what hearing loss is. It means your dynamic range. Look at this guy's little dynamic range here in the high frequencies. The bottom blue line is 0 dB HL. Remember that this graph is all in dB SPL. And that bottom green curve is minimal audible pressure. The softest it takes to hear all the different frequencies with one ear under a headphone. So that bottom curve is, and that's what I said last week, is, capital letters, bold-faced, underline, italics, is 0 dB HL on the audiogram, okay? Needless to say, the audiogram is upside down because more goes down, which is opposite to every other graph in the entire world. That's why this should be spelled the audiogram, O-D-D-I-O-G-R-A-M. Anyway. Here's the upward spread of masking. We're no longer talking about outer versus inner hair cells anymore. We did that before. Today, we concentrate on the upward spread of masking. Looky, looky at the cookie, okay? You've got a low frequency traveling wave. That's the rumbling of a truck, blah, 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 blah. And then you have the peeping of a canary in a cage in your kitchen. Little traveling wave made by beep, 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 beep. The rumbling of the truck outside, look at how its envelope encompasses or masks the high frequencies of the canary. Okay? Lows effectively mask highs. But look at this. It doesn't work the other way around. You can get Harry Canary to peep all she wants. You can really get her to peep, 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 peep all she wants. Yet she can't mask the high, the low frequencies of a soft, rumbling truck. Can't. Impossible. Okay? Her traveling wave, it's also asymmetrical, but it's confined to the base of the cochlea. It's, it's shaped like a kite as well. But do you see what I'm saying here? <clears throat> All traveling waves enter through from the oval window. They start at the oval window, right? And they progress along the basilar membrane toward the apex of the cochlea. So the steep front of the wave always faces the apex of the cochlea. If it's a high frequency, it stays here. I'll stop sharing screen for a second and just... So if it's a high frequency... It'll, it'll remain here. If it's a low frequency, it'll go here, okay? But the wave will, the waves, it's like keys on a piano. The waves will happen here, it's a high frequency. Here, it's a mid frequency. Here, it's a low frequency. But by gum, the waves are asymmetrical, metrical. And it's the asymmetry of the waves that causes the upward spread of masking. Any questions there? Anatomy is tied with acoustics. They are married. Anatomy plus acoustics equals psychoacoustics. Okay? That's why it's really good to always take these two courses, 110 and 120. They are wrapped around each other like carrots that were planted too close. They're just, all right, intertwined. So a lot of things that happen with hearing aids, that's why people hate hearing aids. Background 
place. You've got two reasons now to show why people hate hearing aids. One is that the traveling wave is no longer sharp. That sharpness is gone. You'll notice when I put my fingers like this, look at how my right hand, this finger is bent. I hurt a bat on a bike, so I can never straighten it out. This kind of a fat, weird finger. Normal hand, weird hand. Anyway, <laughs> good, lo lovely to see that this is all recorded for posterity. Oh, yeah. Two reasons why people don't like hearing aids. First, that sharpening of the traveling wave is gone, and you, it can't be replaced. I always say what's lost went down with the flood. It's gone. Secondly, it's the asymmetry of the traveling wave. Lows mask highs, and back ground noise is mostly low frequency. Think of the words hubbub, babble, blah, 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 blah. most background noise is low frequency. And yet the most important sounds of speech are high frequencies, right? Consonants. So think of consonants as the China teacups. And think of background noise as El Toro, the bull. Noise, in a, a bull in a china shop. Okay? Noise and speech. The lows mask highs, better than highs mask lows. So it's, you know, what I would have in my office, I would have pictures. I mean, I would literally show my clients pictures of, 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 of hair cells. I mean, I would show them just, I would just be, be playing around with it. I'd actually, whoops, I'd be showing them pictures of these darn things. Not this, because they don't understand that kind of stuff. But I would show them this picture and this picture. And I would say, perfect hearing looks like this, and impaired hearing looks like that. And that's why hearing aids have a good name. They're a hearing aid. I always counsel clients to have realistic expectations. You're not going to hear like you did when you were 10. But I can turn the clock back 10 years. Okay? I can help. I can help dying hair cells, but I can't help dead ones. And what's gone is gone. So that's why the word hearing instrument sometimes reminds me of a banjo or a piano. I just like the word hearing aid. I like keeping things really simple, like a cane for a bad knee. It helps, but it won't replace the real McCoy. And that's, that's what I think is so important for people to, to digest and understand. Now, we'll look, we talked about the eighth nerve. And look how it's coiled and like a rope. And look at how the fibers from the apex of the cochlea are embedded deep inside the eighth nerve. Whereas the fibers from the inner hair cells that leave, okay, the eighth nerve fibers that leave the inner hair cells, because the eighth nerve is mostly attached to the inner hair cells, okay? Not so much to the outers. Remember the eighth nerve. How long is the eighth nerve? Did you study that yet in anatomy? A little. Um, a little, yeah. We just we're, That was the one we're working on right now. Is cool. The, the, cool. Uh, the eighth nerve is one inch long. It's one inch long. It's the shortest of all your cranial nerves. You've got 12 pairs of cranial nerves. Think of your brain stem as the spinal cord inside your skull. That's all it is. Your spinal cord inside your skull. You've got 12 pairs of nerves radiating off from the eyes, the tongue, for smell, all kinds of crap like that. But the, the, the pair for hearing, it's called the eighth cranial nerve, and it leaves the inner hair cells. Remember, because the inners are afferent. Inners send all info to the brain, but they can't sense sound below 50, so they need the mechanical help of the outers to help them do that. So when you lose outer hair cells, you've got presbycusis. So anyway, looking at this picture here, you can see that the fibers from the base of the cochlea are wrapped around the outside. So you've got 3,000 inner hair cells in each cochlea and 10 eighth nerve fibers are attached to each inner hair cell. So you've got 30,000 fibers in the eighth nerve, 30,000. That's like a small city. I mean, we're, we're talking lots. The eighth nerve is like a rope, okay? It's all fibers 
tiny little fibers like a rope, and it goes to the brain stem. Now, here's something called tuning curves. And all this means is that the eighth nerve, just like the cochlea, is tonotopic. Tonotopic means specific frequencies in specific places, just like the cochlea. Highs at the base, lows at the apex, okay, like keys on a piano. Specific frequencies are re represented in specific places. Same with the eighth nerve. Highs are at the outside of the nerve, lows are at the inside. And they do these things called tuning curves. Now, we'll just pick one. Let's just pick this guy right here. Well, I, I think I like the top right one better. Now, notice the horizontal axis is frequency. And what you're doing in this picture is they've picked six fibers. All they did was they just picked six. You can see six tuning curves here. So of these 30,000 fibers, they picked six, okay, just for the heck of it. And you can, let's talk, look at the top right. You can see at this frequency, the tuning curve is sharp. It's right at the bottom. And this represents the decibels required to get that neuron fiber to fire, to, to, to send info. And at this one particular frequency, not much was needed. Look at that, zero, just a little bit more than zero. But if you tried to get that fiber to fire with a lower frequency, you'd have to use more decibels, wouldn't you? And if I tried to get that same fiber I'm just picking one of these guys. I'll just pick this guy right here. I'm just picking one, okay? If I tried to get that same fiber to fire with a lower frequency, I need still more decibels. Do you see that? So that, that one fiber likes this particular frequency. It's attached to an inner hair cell that represents that specific frequency. But if I try to get that fiber to fire with a higher frequency, Look at how that check mark goes way up, okay? Eighth nerve tuning curves show that the eighth nerve is tonotopic. Secondly, eighth nerve tuning curves just like the traveling wave. They are asymmetrical, just like the traveling wave is. Same, 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 okay? Here's, here's a, I'm gonna try, show you Ted's drawing of it. Here's an eighth nerve tuning curve for normal hearing. I just picked one of those 30,000 fibers and I'm showing you, looky, look. That fiber likes a high frequency, it'll fire with the fewest decibels. Look at this axis here, intensity required to make eighth nerve fiber to fire. Okay, and it, that eighth nerve fiber has a characteristic frequency. It requires the least decibels to get it to fire at one particular frequency. If I go lower in frequency, I need more decibels to get that neuron fiber to fire. If I go higher, I really need more. So again, asymmetrical. Now look at sensory neural loss. Red. With sensory neural loss, I need more decibels to get that fiber to fire, right? You can see I need more. The whole curve is elevated. But what else do you notice about the curve? It's not only elevated, but what else has happened? It's rounded. So look, lots of different frequencies can get that fiber to fire. The sharp tuning is gone because the outer hair cells no longer sharpen the traveling wave. So the dull, rounded traveling wave has sent its crap further up the system. So now that you're finding problems with the eighth nerves too, they're not as tonotopic anymore. They have lost their specific tuning. So the tuning curves are broader. More fi frequencies can make that same fiber fire. All right, now we get to today's topic, 
let's look at the upward spread of masking. Here we go. Due to the asymmetry of the traveling wave, due to the asymmetry of eighth nerve tuning curves, now we come to chapter three. So chapter one, asymmetrical traveling wave. How come? Outer hair cell damage. But also just the fact that it is shaped like a kite. It's just, that's just the way the traveling wave is. The front is steep, the tail slopes. And we talked about Miss Harry Canary, and we talked about the rumbling of a truck. Well, let's look at this now. The asymmetrical traveling wave and the lack of the sharpening and the eighth nerve tuning curves and what happens with sensory neural loss. Now let's take it home to what happens in real life. In real life, I'm giving you a thousand hertz tone. And I'm presenting that 1,000 hertz tone. It could be under a headphone, but think of it this way. Think of sitting in front of a speaker, and you're hearing a 1,000 hertz. Okay? Now, now I'm going to take a band of noise, because I won't, don't want to mask the tone with another tone. Otherwise, you'll get mixed up. You don't know which is the, the, the masker and the maskee, if you know what I mean. Okay, the employer or the employee. We're talking about the tone is this line here, beep, and you're hearing it at some decibel level. And now I want to mask that tone with a narrow band of noise surrounding a thousand hertz. So if the tone is beep, the noise is, it's just this narrow band of noise. And notice, I didn't have to make the noise much more than the tone, and it covered it. And you can see that literally in this picture. The masking noise covered the tone. It masked the tone. All right. So we talk masking now. I maybe should do this whole lecture with this mask on. Maybe that's just the best way to do it. At any <laughs> rate, <laughs> let's say I try to mask that thousand hertz tone with a lower frequency. So you're sitting there hearing from a speaker, and now I'm choosing a 500 hertz tone. I thought, I got a little pooch there. Sorry, I'll mute myself. Oh, no problem. That's kind of funny. Anyway, so let's say I try to mask the 1,000 hertz tone with a 500 hertz narrow band, a band of noise surrounding 500 hertz. I've got to make it more intense, don't I? Because it's not the same frequency as the tone. And let's say I try to mask the 1,000 hertz tone with a 250 hertz band of noise. Now my, this is 250 hertz, let's say. I'm going to have to make 250 hertz narrow band of noise more intense yet for it to mask the 1,000 hertz tone. And let's say I try to mask that same 1,000 hertz tone with a 125 hertz narrow band of noise. I've got to make that more intense yet. So you can see the further I go away, the lower I go with masking noise, the more intense I need to make the masking noise in order to mask that 1,000 hertz tone. But if I try to mask the 1,000 hertz tone with a higher frequency, look at how much more intense I need to make it. Again, now follow my screen here. Lows mask highs better than highs mask lows. Okay? It's just, it's all because of the upward spread of masking. And what's the source of the upward spread of masking? The asymmetrical traveling wave envelope. Can't help it. That's the way God made us. It's just the way the cochlea works. Okay? No, lows mask highs better than highs mask lows. Now, what happens with sensory neural loss? Now, I didn't, you don't have this picture, but you can draw it on, on your previous one. Normal hearing, the black backward check mark. Okay, all I'm doing is tracing the, 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 the boxes or whatever. Sensory neural loss is the red. Okay, first of all, he can't hear as well. So if he's trying to hear the 1,000 hertz tone, 
let's maybe, if I had drawn this, maybe if I was to draw this here, okay, if I was to actually go into here and, uh, and, and, and draw this, this, this line here so it was larger, you know, why don't I just make it taller? No, I don't want that one. Not that one, Ted. Pick the other one. Pick this little guy right there. That's the one. So now I want to mask. Let's say I, he can't hear as well, right? So the tone has to be louder because he's got a hearing loss. Here, I think I'll save that. That's a good change. I'll just save that. Okay. So let's. So he can't hear the thousand hertz tone. So I had to make it more. So now I'm I'm trying doing that same masking experiment with him. So A, the tone had to be louder because he's got a hearing loss. B, I'm finding out that if I go lower in frequency, look at this, not much more intensity is needed to mask that tone. And if I go lower in frequency, not much more intensity is needed to mask that same tone. And if I go lower still, not much more is needed to mask that tone. And if I go higher in frequency, yeah, a little bit more. He still has an asymmetrical shape there. But he's more easily masked. Background noise pisses him off more. He's, got, he's more easily masked. And how come? Because he's lost the sharpening of the traveling wave due to the outer hair cells. He's got outer hair cell damage. His traveling wave peaks are more rounded. Okay, so essentially, that's the story of the upward spread of masking. So I'm going to now read. We'll just take a take a read here from the top, and we'll do this. Will all be review, and then we'll be out of here. What do you say? All right, here we go. Masking general concepts. Masking is any sound that covers or hides another sound from being heard. In psychoacoustics, masking is usually put into the same ear as the signal, ipsilateral. In audiometry, the stuff you're studying in 140, is it? No, 130. Masking the sound is put into the opposite ear to eliminate it from participating. They call that contralateral masking. Well, that's not what we're talking. We're talking the top one. Okay, so it's in the same ear as the signal, or the guy sitting in front of a speaker, and you're having stuff come in both ears. Okay, effective masking is linear. For every increase in tone intensity, the masker has to be raised by the same amount. So that's obvious. Here, masking is usually done via bands of noise. The signal tone masked by another tone would confuse a subject. So masking is always done by noise. Don't worry about this masking and beats. Couldn't care less. Leave it alone. Next. Psychophysical tuning curves. Now, psychophysical tuning curves are these. This is psychophysical tuning curves. Okay? You've got two tuning curves. One's eighth nerve tuning curves. The other one's Psychophysical tuning curves, that's the masking, upward spread of masking. They're the same shape, they have the same crap, okay? And the cause of them both, both is the asymmetrical traveling wave. All right, cool, back to the read. Uh, asymmetry of tuning curves shows that lows mask highs better than highs mask lows. Again, caused by the asymmetrical traveling wave. You can tell I'm up in Canada here. See how we spell traveling with two L's? Isn't that weird? <laughs> That's how you can tell a Canadian from an American. They, they always have two L tra canceling, traveling. Well, the, anyway, masking and reduced frequency resolution. The word frequency resolution, look where it's grayed out. That's the ability to distinguish between frequencies close together. Frequency resolution is impaired with outer hair cell damage, right? Your delta F, what we've talked about a couple of weeks ago. Your ability to distinguish between frequencies is gone. Tuning curves become, lose their point and become more rounded. Where have you heard that before? Poor frequency resolution means masking will have a more pronounced effect. Where did you hear that before? Okay, he's more easily masked. 
Consider some signal you want to mask. For impaired ear, auditory system responds more equivalently. In other words, similarly to maskers of different frequencies. Background noise is the most common masker. High frequency consonants are most easily masked. No wonder why those with sensory neural loss are so bothered by background noise. And here again, hearing aids cannot sharpen a biological peak in a passive traveling wave. That's gone. Something well, okay, something else to be uh, suspicious of in clinical audiology. Uh, I could show you this. Yeah, I think just for the fun of it, just for the heck of it. You're going to see a couple of audiograms like this. Here's a, here's an, You have this in your PowerPoint, but I'm just going to show you here, okay? Here you've got a reverse hearing loss. These are rare. You don't see these very often, okay? Usually hearing loss slopes down in the highs, doesn't it? Most presbycusis is mild to moderate, good hearing in the bass, poorer hearing in the lows. But if I, like a thief in the night, came in and killed off all of your hair cells below a thousand hertz, just left, it took out every inner hair cell <laughs> and left you with normal hearing above a thousand hertz and no hair cells, not outer, just removed them below a thousand hertz. And if I tested you in the morning with headphones and put sound into the ear that I ripped the hair cells out of, your hearing wouldn't be at the bottom here for the lows. It would look like this. And how come? Because of the shape of the traveling wave. Look, here's the hair cell floor. I just laid it across the audiogram. I just laid your, your, your basilar membrane where your hair cells are. I unrolled your cochlea and laid it across the top of the audiogram. And this we'll call this low frequency area your cochlear dead region because remember I ripped out every hair cell there. By the way, if you had no inner hair cells and you had outer hair cells, you'd still be deaf because outer hair cells don't send info to your brain, right? Outer hair cells just help inners pick up sounds below 50. It's all about the inners, okay? So if I killed off your inner hair cells and tested you in the morning, your hearing would only look like a moderate hearing loss in the lows. And how come? Because of the shape of the wave. Look at the picture here. If I set 250 hertz tone, and I, 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 pres I, I make that about 50 or 60 dB, I've made a traveling wave in your cochlea at around 250 hertz, but the tail of the wave slopes to the healthy hair cells. You're going to raise your hand. You're going to have heard a tone. You're going to have heard 1,000 hertz, or you're going to have heard, I should say, 250 hertz with these hair cells. Isn't that weird? I mean, that's, you're going to hear 250 hertz with 1,000 hertz hair cells. That, they call that off-frequency hearing. It's audiological checkmate. It doesn't, it, it, you can't help it. That's just the way your cochlea is. Now, let's say like a thief in the night, I went into your cochlea and took out every inner hair cell above 1,000 hertz. Okay, let's play the game the other way around. And I tested you in the morning. Your hearing would look more like you thought it would. You'd have really bad hearing in the high frequencies. How come it would look different? How come these, these thresholds would be so bad, <clears throat> whereas these aren't? And the reason why is, again, the shape of the traveling wave. <clears throat> the further I go into your dead area, Look at how much more intense I have to keep making the sound for the front of the wave to stimulate living hair cells. Do you see that? So if I tested you there, I'd have to make it a little bit intense for that front of the wave to stimulate living hair cells if I went further 
into the dead area, I'd have to really increase the tone so the front of the wave still stimulated in the living hair cells. And if I went further into the dead, into the heart of a Texas Saturday night, I went further into the dead area, I'm going to have to jack up the intensity dramatically for the front of that wave to stimulate living hair cells. Do you see that the, the shape of the audiogram literally is a picture of the wave of the cochlea. It's, that's, now that, this is cochlear. What I'm teaching you here, what we are talking about here, this is audiology. This is what they are learning at Missouri State University. This is the stuff that audiologists do not think that the HIS will know. I'm cheating. I'm taking a piece out of the book so that you would absolutely flip out an audiologist by what it is that you're learning at OTC. And I want to do that because then like an old salmon, I can swim up the stream to die. If I have made, if, you, if OTC grads can flip out an audiologist by what they know, that's great because that's Jesus judo. That'll freak them out. There's too much politics out there. There's too many people that think that the HIS knows nothing and that the HIS is a hearing aid dealer and that the HIS is simply into sales. Put this shop and search and shop safely with Norton. Get out of here. Boring. Anyway, <clears throat> and what we need to show is that you do in your education learn the difference between outer and inner hair cells. You do learn about the upward spread of masking. You have learned it from a physiological point of view, not the way IHS in Michigan would teach you, because they'll just tell you lows mask highs better than highs mask lows. They will not go into why. You have learned why. It makes the difference between a technician and a technologist. A technician pushes buttons. A technologist, you study the word right out of the Gospel John, logos, the word. And a technologist knows how come. And that's what audiologists think you don't know. And that's what we need to end right there. So anyway, the rest of this stuff here is... Eh, you know, critical bands, blah, blah, blah. I could talk about it, and I'll just mention it just to get it out of our face, but I'm not, you won't find a single thing um, about it on, on, your, on your exams or nothing like that. I just, I'm just going to show you what it is just because people have, people have heard of this crap before. So if I hit this thing here, let's go to critical bands. Critical, oh, yeah, here we go. I'll just pull up this guy. Critical bands comes from a guy by the last name of Fletcher. He did masking experiments too. Yeah, we got 10 minutes left, so I'll just kind of slow down here. He did masking experiments. He gave a person a tone, and he wasn't looking at the upward spread of masking anymore. That, 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 okay, they figured that stuff out. He just, let's say the guy hears a thousand hertz tone, and he was saying, how wide do the bands of noise have to be in order to mask that tone? So let's make, let's take a narrow band of noise and put it around the thousand hertz tone. So the light blue line is the tone. And then like, a pre, like the previous picture, the black thing here is the masking noise surrounding that 1000 hertz tone. And yup, it's a little bit louder than the tone in order to mask it. All right. So then he thought, hmm. So he first masked that 1000 hertz tone with a broad band. See that line going across the top? That's white noise. Remember what white noise is? It comprises all the different frequencies. If you take a color wheel with red, blue, yellow, green, and spin it fast, the color wheel looks white. White is the presence of all colors. White noise is the presence, of, it's a broad band of noise, and it contains all frequencies of even intensity. So, yeah, he made the white noise a little bit louder than the tone, and it masked the tone. But then he said to himself, self, why don't I make the noise narrower? 
So now we're looking at the green. And the green is narrower than the big broad band of white noise. And when it was made a little bit louder than the noise, yep, it covered the tone. And then he made that band of noise surrounding a thousand hertz, he made it narrower, the red. And yup, he didn't, nothing changed. It still masked the tone. So then he made the red, he made that even narrower. Now we're looking at the black. And he found out that if he made it narrower than the black, if he made it narrower than this, uh-uh. Then the noise would have to be boosted up in intensity. There was a critical bandwidth required. And if he made that narrower than the critical bandwidth, then it wouldn't mask that tone anymore. He'd have to jack up the intensity of the noise in order to mask that tone. And there's lots of jargon. So now we'll just, I'll just, we're ending our thing here. You just look at your, your, your notes. And we'll just move it down here. Critical bands. Fletcher. Masking with wide band white noise is not very efficient for masking a pure tone. Why? Because it's friggin' loud. You're hearing all the different frequencies at the same intensity. That becomes bothersome to you. Narrower better, narrower, better, you got fewer frequencies, narrower yet, better, but you can't go past a certain amount. According to Fletcher, the term critical bands represents, ah, boring, 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 let's see, narrow band noise makes for a more efficient masker. This is the critical band theory. And this leads to your field testing under headphones. Now we're talking about masking in audiometry. And if I go to stop share, and you gotta look at my ugly mug again, now we're talking no longer upward spread of masking. Now we're taking it home to your field. You're masking a good ear to keep the bad, you're masking the good ear to keep it busy while you're testing a bad ear. You are going to be using one third octave bands. These are critical bandwidths. So the masking noise, when you're testing the client with a thousand hertz, what's the masking noise coming into the other headphones? So you're putting a thousand hertz into my bad ear, and I'm masking the good ear with narrow band of noise. Right? That's what masking did. They, did have you been have, have you actually listened to the masking noise yet? And you, you haven't listened, you will in lab. Turn it on. So you'll play play a thousand hertz. Beep. Okay, now ma put masking and it's gonna if you turn the masking noise to two thousand hertz, it's gonna sound a little different. Turn it to four thousand hertz, it's gonna sound different. It's gonna be like Okay, it's going to be narrow bands of noise to mask higher and higher tones. So the band of noise is like a cup laying on top of the tone. That's what you're going to be doing. So if I'm testing a thousand hertz, I'm testing a thousand hertz in, in this left ear, I'm going to put a narrow band of noise that surrounds a thousand hertz into the good ear. If I'm testing 2,000 hertz in the bad ear, the narrow band of masking noise is going to be put into this good ear and it will surround 2,000 hertz. If I'm testing 4,000 hertz in this ear, the narrow band of masking noise put into my good ear will surround 4,000 hertz. And all I'm saying here is that those bands of noise are about a third of an octave wide. That's your critical bandwidth. Fletcher figured that out. And the reason why you want to use critical bandwidths is for client comfort. Well, I don't know why I keep hitting that stupid escape button here. What I want to just, the reason, whoops, I'll just share a screen. The reason why you want to use critical bandwidths is because this black box is less annoying to you. It's going to be softer. 
I don't have to. If I use a broad band of white noise, you're hearing all the different frequencies at the same intensity to cover one stupid tone. It's like, what do you call it? Uh, using a truck to drive over a fly. Why not just kill the fly with a fly swatter? <laughs> you know, just use something that makes more sense. So if you don't need all those frequencies to mask one stupid little pure tone, why not just confine your masking noise so that it just surrounds that tone? That's all. It's more comfortable for you. It's not as loud. And critical bandwidth is how narrow could we possibly make it? That's all. Okay, I'll stop sharing here. And I'll invite you to ask any questions you might have. But we're good. This is, I'm done. I'm not gonna, the last part of your notes was kind of like on binaural masking level differences. You've kind of covered that already when we talked about the cocktail effect. Okay? That dealt with background babble, the reason you got two ears and we won't go there. So that's why I'm not covering it here. We're done. You're done psychoacoustics. Okay? Ask me a question. Turn on your mics. Go go for it. If you, any of this stuff, if you want clarification of something or just you know something isn't sitting right, let me know. I can you go over inner and outer hair cells just real fast? For again? sure. Because, because when I read it, I'm confused as to you know it always talks about the outers are 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 there. They get everything first. I thought, but no, no. no. It's no. not huh? it's, it's, No. Outers, no, the outer inner hair cells are all along the basilar membrane. Okay, so I'm going to go to that. Whoops, I keep hitting that stupid escape button here. Why don't I just go to here? I'll show you here. Share screen. I'm glad you're asking, Kelly. You just ask, ask, ask. Otherwise, I'm not doing my job. So here we go. I'm going to go over to the top, top slide. Okay, here. Let's just take uh, this picture here. Inner hair cells, if you follow my cursor, would be all along here. Okay, one row of inner hair cells. Basically, these inner hair cells. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they are all along the basilar membrane. The basilar membrane is the floor upon which all your hair cells stand. You have one row of inner hair cells all along the basilar membrane, and then you've got three rows of outer hair cells here, four rows of outer hair cells here, and five over here. So you can see that this picture here is probably taken from the base of the cochlea because there's only three rows of outer hair cells. Yeah. Now, inner hair cells are attached to the eighth nerve. Each inner hair cell gets 10 eighth nerve fibers. So there's a total of like 30,000 eighth nerve fibers. The outer hair cells aren't really attached to the, out, to the eighth nerve. So, the, so if you had, most people have this, this problem. If you look at the screen here, most people have this, outer hair cell damage. And you see that the inners aren't so damaged. It's the outers that are screwed up. And what do the outers do? Well, you're looking at this picture here. They mechanically shrink. When I look at them, they're, they're, they're like test tubes. They literally shrink. Notice that their hairs, see how their hairs are attached to the bottom of that membrane. They're literally attached. So when they, when they shrink, they pull that membrane down so that these hairs can get bent, so that they can send info to the brain. Because it's only when the hairs are bent that info goes, here's your eighth nerve. That info goes to the brain. So if there's enough fluid motion, if a loud sound comes to your ear, there's enough fluid motion taking place in the cochlea to wiggle those hairs all by themselves. But if the sound stimulating your ear is less than 50, there's not enough fluid motion to wiggle those hairs. So the outer hair cells are kicking into action. They shrink and pull that membrane down so that it can bend those hairs. So you're talking 50 dB? Yep. Is that what you're talking? Yep. yep. Okay. Yep, 50 dB, yep, you bet. So like for someone like, this weekend I got a, a, something kind of cool because like Megan and I, we can't go to labs because right. we live out of state. Right. Um, 
I happened to find out that a neighbor is a speech therapist and oh, wow. she has a portable audio meter yep. that um, for her school. Yep. Oh, cool. It only does um, uh, air conduction, but it was something yeah. cool. So Easter Sunday, I gave hearing tests to the family. <laughs> ah, cool. And my stepdad has hearing loss. Um, he wears hearing aids. Right. So, um, so for him, his hearing loss, like at a thousand hertz, was like he was at fifty dB. Yeah. So is 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 he all his outers gone at that point? And yeah, it's, he's got more. Yep, I'd say he's he's hearing with his inner hair cells at that point. Correct. That point. Yeah, because it go and then when we got up to eight thousand hertz, it, the machine didn't let us go above sixty dB, and he didn't respond at all. And you know so. why? Because okay, <clears throat> so to tell it to make a long story short, he's got mostly outer hair cell damage at a thousand hertz, and then above a thousand hertz, his hearing gets worse. So yeah. guess what? He's got he's got outer and inner hair cell damage. Yeah. See, he was on the flight line in the service, so the VA. Yeah. Is it makes sense. Yep. Yeah. Sens sensory presbycusis means mild to moderate. Mild around 30 dB loss, moderate 50 to 60. Okay? Neural implies inner hair cell pathology, which communicates with the eighth nerve. Now, so if your hearing loss is 80 dB, let's say you've got an 80 decibel hearing loss, now you've got outer, not only are your outer hair cells damaged, but now you've got neural damage as well. Okay? Yeah. Outers die before inners, but by gum, inners can die too. If, outer, if I went in like a thief in the night and took out every one of your outer hair cells, you would have a, probably a, like a flat 50, 50 dB hearing loss. You'd be able to hear 70 and 80, no problem. But you just couldn't hear below 50. Get it? Mm -hmm. That's presbycusis. Presbycusis is mostly sensory outer hair cell damage. Get it? Yeah, the peak of their traveling wave is more dull and rounded. Big hairy deal. Doesn't mean they're not nice people. It just means that they can't hear very well when the sound's below 50. And background noise will really bug them and they're going to have problems. Okay? Neural means now you've got like an 80 decibel hearing loss. Well, guess what? Now, not only do, is your traveling wave dull and rounded, but now a garbled message is being sent up to your brain because the inner hair cells are damaged. So now they have terrible speech discrimination. People with mild to moderate loss, like 40 to 50, they've got pretty good speech discrimination. If you put the headphones on and say to them, Say the word cow, cow. Say the word tree, tree. Say the word dust, dust. No problem. Crank it up enough for them to hear. Perfect. Their speech discrimination will be 85, 90%. Okay? Take the neural loss now. The guy with 70 to 80 decibel hearing loss. Crank the sound up to his most comfortable loudness level, to what he thinks is nice. Say the word dog. Odd. Say the word tree. Free. Their speech discrimination. <clears throat> okay. They're going to need lots of gain or amplification with the hearing aids. They're also going to be in big need of increasing signal to noise ratio. They're going to have real different problems. But guess what? They're an easier population to fit. You know why? Because to them, the glass is half full with the hearing aids. Without the hearing aids, put the hearing aid in, hey man, I'm part of the world again. Take the person with mild to moderate loss, what a wuss, because they can hear without the hearing aids. Mm -hmm. So they're, the glass to them is half empty. How come I can't hear him? <laughs> They're all, they're the hardest people to fit. Their hearing aids cost more. They've got more bells and whistles. They've got all the, whereas the guy with severe hearing loss, he just wants power, wonder, work, and power, and the Lord, just give me power. I can't hear without the damn things. So he's driving a standard transmission. He's just driving a simple, powerful car. Whereas the guy with a mild to moderate hearing loss, 
he's driving an Audi with all the bells and whistles, and he's still pissed off. Okay, it's a, because he can still hear without his hearing aids. You see, so like clinically, all of this stuff, anyway, I'm talking too much. And my time is running out. I only have an hour and 15 or the, the Zoom won't record it. So, okay. I better bid you adieu. Okay, well, thank you for the clarification. Yes, you thank bet. you. Absolutely. It's, it's fun talking to you. I, I, I'm, I really like teaching this class better than the second level class I teach tomorrow morning because no one shows up. Oh, that's a bummer. That is. Anyway, adios. Adios. See you next adios. later. You bet. Okay.